Nikola Meech is the founder and CEO of Matic, and he has one piece of advice for anyone entering the startup arena. When people ask me like, hey, what have you learned through this experience in starting your own company? I would say like how to ruthlessly prioritize because it's your job to be able to decipher what is valid and what is habit that's habitual. Building, scaling, and maintaining success is every entrepreneur's dream, and there's one way to get there, by consistently meeting customer expectations and finding product market fit. On this episode of IT Visionaries, Nikola peels back the curtain on how he stepped outside his comfort zone of product management and took a chance in launching Matic, a personalization tool designed to automate Google Slides and PowerPoint presentations with customized data points. If you've been in sales, you've made one of these, and it sucks. So I'm looking forward to hearing exactly how he does it. Nikola also explains why customer success is dependent on managing expectations and how data-driven insights are not here to kill dashboards, but to assist them. IT Visionaries is created by the team at Mission.org and brought to you by Salesforce Platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Innovate fast, empower every employee, and scale with confidence from anywhere with a customer at the center of everything you do. Learn more at salesforce.com slash platform. Welcome everyone to another episode of IT Visionaries. And today we have a special guest, Nick Meech, the CEO and co-founder of Matic. Nick, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. All right, we let every single one of our guests go ahead, introduce your company. Tell me what is Matic and what does it do? Yeah, so... Matic is basically what we do at a high level is we automate the generation of data-driven presentations within Google Slides or PowerPoint. So we're not trying to replace those two systems. You can kind of think of us as the layer that sits on top that allows you to connect to all the different data sources to kind of automate some of that repetitive, uh, those repetitive presentations. So we, we primarily work with sales teams, customer success, so both farmers and hunters. And, you know, we automate things like quarterly business reviews, renewal decks, things that take two, three hours because you're having to go to all these different data sources to pull the data and tell that story. We want Matic to be there. So with a click of a button, you know, you have that deck fully generated and it's customized to that particular touch point or customer. All right. Now, I want to ask, do you have personal experience with this problem? Because I, I actually do. I, uh, but I've used other tools. So I want to kind of hear about your personal experience using them and understanding you know, what is it that you identified in Marketplace that was missing? Because I have used some auto report, auto generation tools before. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm curious to hear some of your feedback on what you've experienced. Because, you know, my my experience is more than five years old. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Yeah. So I'll kind of take it way back. So I worked at a, a small startup back in the day called Blue Nose Analytics, which was a customer success software startup. So the, the likes of Gainsight or Tatango. And so that was one of the biggest feature or like requests that we got from our customers was, hey, my refs, our CSMs are going to your guys' product taking screenshots and we're going to Tableau and Looker and we're going and they're putting together these like quarterly business reviews. And about that was what, five, six years ago, it was pretty new at the point. Customer success was evolving. And when I, when I joined LinkedIn, I had joined a, like an internal program management team that built internal nar or narratives and internal tools for our sales team. And again, this was a huge pain point for our sales team where they were coming to us saying, hey, we spent all this time putting together these data-driven, you know, whether it's pitch decks, renewal decks, QBRs, and how do we automate? So like with the click of a button, it goes and pulls all the data and automates it. And so that's really kind of where, where it started. I had built, I'd worked on an internal tool at LinkedIn and thought, hey, this is kind of following me in my career. And I think there's a massive opportunity to kind of disrupt this. And you are right. I would say we are kind of a cross-section between BI. So like the tableaus of the world, look, we're not trying to replace dashboards, right? Because dashboards still have a purpose. They're exploratory, help you find those insights. But then it's like, how do I, there's always a last mile dilemma. How do I get those insights that I find? And how do I then add it to a document, in this case being PowerPoint or Google Slides, on a continuous basis? And that's really what we're trying to focus in on. Similar to like what Marketo did or any of these email automation tools did with email templates, we're trying to do that with, with document templates, right? Where you know, you've got a repetitive presentation that you're trying to automate and let Matic kind of be that store now. 
you know, I think the feedback that we got really early on is like, if this is like trying to replace PowerPoint or Google, we're not going to use it, right? Because our reps and our users are familiar with how PowerPoint works, with how Google works. They didn't want to learn necessarily in that new tool. Yeah. So we made the conscious decision to kind of build on top of those systems so that the, the end user are really familiar with how, how, how that works. So it sounds like you had hands-on experience that you were using and leveraging these products. And then of course you, you, you were in charge of actually making a solution for it while uh, your previous career. And you identified that this is a potential marketplace opportunity for, for yourself. Give us a high level of what you have experienced that's missing from these compile. Uh, let's call them document comp compilers. I don't know what else to call them. Um, I know Conga makes them. There's a lot of different companies that make them where it says, hey, I'm going to take information from different places and build up presentations, templates, proposals, quotes, all kinds of stuff like that. Yeah. But, you know, without being, you know, when I think about the problems I saw there, without seeing and understanding the problem, I don't know if our audience can understand what you saw the opportunity as and what makes the product unique. So tell me a little bit about what you saw was missing from those existing compiling tools. I think if you, if you look at the, I think the problem exists for two personas, right? The people that are actually generating the documents or the presentations, that's the end user, right? Like, Hey, the sales rep, mm -hmm. and you're right. There are maybe tools out there that help the end user get what they need hundred percent. I think what, what was missing was actually on the admin side. How do I connect to different data sources pretty easily without having to like, you know, lift a, a, a massive rock or get a ton of resources, right? And then how do I maintain these templates and narratives? How do I create the dynamic content? And I, I felt like that was what was missing was really the, on the admin side, this ability to, to scale a narrative or onboard a template really quickly. Um, and so our, our product and our platform, like I said, has those two personas as, as we've built quite a bit on the admin side, which was Hey, if, if, if you can't onboard your particular use case on a Matic, connect to the different data sources, you know, create all this different dynamic content, then the end user is not going to get any benefit, right? So we spent a lot of time initially figuring out, okay, what are the different types of dynamic content, text, charts, tables, images, right? Conditional that our customers are looking for, or the market is looking for. Um, and then how does that translate over to the end user? So I would definitely say, the big thing that we saw early on when we were doing our due diligence before starting the company was that there really wasn't this admin experience to be able to alter these narratives quickly and onboard them. I mean, what you're describing is exactly what I experienced, you know, like I said, five, six years ago, which was that if we wanted to make adjustments to our compiling tool, we actually had to have, well, we didn't have to have, but it was hard enough that there was actually service providers, yep. systems integrators that worked with these compiling tools. They would set it up for you. So you'd have to open up a service order. Uh, that person would have to do like a full discovery, you know, analysis. <laughs> I'm just trying to get a table in my presentation. I got to <laughs> go through this process. I know the table's right there. I could see it. He's like, well, how are you doing it today? He's like, oh, literally my guy goes in there and copies and pastes it out. Yeah. <laughs> like that's, how, that's how it's done today. So where did you focus your energies in regards to building this application? Was it more on the front end GUI where it was going to be like, hey, how do we make this simple? Or is it more back end? Because if you're going to connect and make... so. Like the, that's the power of Zapier, right? Is the power of Zapier is they've made it easy to connect applications. Yeah. So they did all the hard work to figure out how the applications worked. So where were you focusing your energies? Like, is it on the, the front end interface to make it easy, the back end integrations to make sure all these data points could come in? How, where would you, where was your energy or was it both places? Yeah. I mean, it was a little bit, of, a little bit of both. I would say definitely the focus was kind of on the, on the front end to be able to like help people create the dynamic content to onboard the templates like that. At the end of the day, that was the crux of the problem that we're trying to solve for. And so we spent a lot of time there. Obviously we did have to build some connectors initially and, you know, a lot of people want to go directly to their data source, like database, right? So like, and those are pretty easy to build, right? Like, hey, connecting to Snowflake, connecting to MySQL, connecting to uh, Postgres, Redshift, uh, Google BigQuery. Like, those are very easy connectors to build now, you know, but like at the end of the day, we really tried to focus in on the workflow on how these admins were able to create the dynamic content and then add it to the different templates and, and then also make changes, right? Like, we view content, especially, and this is from the sales standpoint, right? And that's what we're starting initially with is we view content like software. You know, it shouldn't be one of those things where let's say you and I are working at a company and, and we're CSMs and we come up with a QBR that the entire CSM team uses. What happens and what we hear most often 
is they'll spend all the time putting together this perfect narrative, right? And then no one touches the template for about a year, right? And then the template goes stale. And then it's like, okay, who wants to put on their OKRs to update the QBR template? And it shouldn't be that way. It should be more iterative where, hey, we, we start with this template V1, CSMs are using it, and then they come back to you and say, Albert, ah, oh, man, I'd love you know, I kind of want to tweak this here. I think this data point isn't resonating that much with the customer. How about we talk about ROI this way? And you can kind of A-B test. And that's the way it should be, just like software. Just when you launch software, it's not like you stop for a year and then come back to it. Yeah, it's never done. Yeah, it's never done, right? You're constantly getting feedback. And we view content, especially data-driven content, the same way, right? Where you should be making those iterations. And, and our hypothesis initially was that the reason why people weren't doing that was because they didn't have the tools to be able to make those changes pretty quickly, right? To your point earlier, you got to go get services. You got to get a statement of work done to like make any changes on the back. No, we wanted to make it really easy for you to be able to like say, hey, you know what? I should be able to make this change pretty quickly. And then let's see what, let's see how the field responds to this, right? Yeah. And for the people that don't, aren't as familiar with this process, if you don't have some type of document automation or document creation, what you're relying on is everyone being just really good dealing with their own cloud templates, downloading. <laughs> and of course, every, listen, I, I've worked with hundreds of AEs. They're all terrible um, at, at making presentations. Well, we gotta, we gotta give some, we gotta give the AEs some love here. We can't, we can't, we can't. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. At making okay. presentations, man. Because, because you're right. Because each one is going to want to tailor the presentation just a little bit for the prospect. A good AE is going to say, hey, listen, I need a more personalized message. So I need a customer that's more relatable. I need a customer that's, yep. or experience an outcome that the prospect is trying to um, experience themselves. And so they're going back through their information, whatever tools they have, they're grabbing data out, they're transporting it in. Yep. Effectively, you know, someone asked me once, I remember, because it was, you know, working in a 100 person sales organization is like, they asked me like, do you know wh who's using what template? I'm like, I have no idea. Yeah. So <laughs> just no idea. Right. And if you took a look at the best reps and then you look at the ones that were, were underperforming, you know, how do you get the same information? How do you put them on an even playing field? You would learn very quickly. I think most VPs of sales would know this is that a lot of times the toolkit is no longer the same as in one rep is using a different toolkit than another because they've like you said, made modifications for what they need. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I totally agree. And, and this is what we normally see within the market, right? Is you have enablement or like CS ops, sales ops, create a template for all these different touch points, right? And then they, in the template, they have placeholders that say, hey, here, go to Tableau and get active users or go here to get XYZ metrics, plop them in here. And it kind of tells that cohesive story, but it's super time intensive to go you know, and then what the reps do is they make a copy of the template and then they go to all the different data sources and just like looking if, you know, in today's world, if you've got 40, 50, 60 accounts in your book of business, and let's say you're just talking about one touch point, a quarterly business review, right? Which is, I think, normal best practice. Yeah. If you ask any CS leader or any sales leader, like, hey, we should be doing some sort of like business review on a, on a quarterly basis. Often they don't do it because of how long it takes, right? Because yeah. it's taking me two to three hours. I'm going to pick and choose, okay, which accounts this month or this quarter get that business review. Um, and it's not because I don't want to do it. It's just because I just don't have the time to be able to do it. Yeah. You don't want to spend your whole day making PowerPoints. Like that's, I mean... That's just the reality of life, right? Like, yeah, exactly, exactly. I love PowerPoints, though. I do. I agree. I agree. I, I, I'm the data nerd, though. I do love the storytelling. And you like PowerPoints? Ah, uh, man, I, I'm a big. And that was kind of my role at, at LinkedIn. Is, like I said, we would create these narratives, and it's just fun to be able to dig into into the data and see, like, hey, what is a compelling story that we can make out of this, and not just data dump, right? I think that's the problem in today's in today's tech world is we like to, we use data often, but it's, it's like, well, so what's a, so what behind the data? Yeah. Right. And I think that's some, something that we hope we are enabling through Matic is being able to tell that. So what by templatizing these narratives and scaling them throughout the sales team. Well, you know, the, you hit on a good point about building that great story because I used to tell people, I used to tell people all the time that I think deals are one at the desk. They're not actually one during a presentation because a good presenter is one thing. But then when that person sits down and says, I've seen now five presentations, now I got to figure out which one of these I'm going to lean into. 
and I used to always say deals are one of the desk, like when they're in the desk, when they're with their, whoever's decision makers are quiet, you have no influence on it. That's when you'll figure out <laughs> if you were good enough, which of course you don't want to find out after the fact that you weren't good enough. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I always want to ask founders who are going into businesses that I would call crowded, right? There's other products here in this space that do this kind of thing. You have a unique spin on it. How about, tell me about, you know, I know you're still in early stages, but talk about getting that first wave of customers to give you a shot. What was that like? I mean, it definitely is hard. Uh, I think anytime you go into B2B, uh, this is our, my co-founder and I, our first venture, first time doing a startup. So there's a, there's a big learning curve, right? I, I don't come from a sales background. And what I've learned is that like, you need to become a, like you are selling, selling, selling nonstop, right? And yeah, you better sell. <laughs> uh, it was a new muscle for me to flex, right? Because I've always come from an analytics or product. My, my background is product and analytics and it's just different. Yes, you are selling, but you're selling internally. I think selling internally is a little bit different than selling externally. So luckily, you know, we, the way that we approached it is we looked at folks that, you know, we had in our network and we mostly targeted CS and account management at first, because I knew from my blue nose days that that was like a big pain point and we kept hearing it in our research. And, you know, we went out to those folks and like, Hey, here's kind of what we're thinking about building. Here's some like high level mocks. And we really tried to bring them along on the journey. And I found that when you did that, it really resonated with the people and they make them feel like, hey, they're solving this problem with you, right? And not just like, you're not looking at them as a, as a customer or beta customer. They're actually kind of part of Matic and, and, and part of this journey. So we found a few customers that were willing to take a bet on us and honestly, super grateful. One of those Envoy, big shout out to them. They were an early adopter and you know they were like, hey, this is a big problem within our CS org. And and let's see how we can automate it. And they've just been a great partner along the way. So what was that like when you got that first piece of feedback? Because I have yet to meet the developer who on, uh, let's say V1 or <laughs> version A, whatever you want to call it, where the customer was like, oh, this is it. Um, <laughs> it's usually, it's usually, it usually gets a little bit of resistance and then you go and keep iterating from there. What was that like, that first experience seeing a customer use it? Yeah. I mean, it was, it was kind of surreal, right? Because you think about this, you kind of think about, I think Reed Hoffman says like, uh, he, he even mentions is that you can't, you know, don't let, um, if you are nervous, if you wait until the product is perfect, then you're too late, right? Like yeah. you're, the, the, the boat has left the yard, right? And I tend to agree, like, you know, when we were shipping the product, it was like, it wasn't perfect, but the feedback we got was ultimately like very, very positive, right? Like there's obviously things that, that, you know, we needed to work on or button up 100%, but the end users were, were really in love. And then also on the admin side, we were getting a lot of positive feedback. Hey, like this is saving my time now because I'm not having to like do ad hoc analysis for my, the reps or do ad hoc queries. Like I can just scale this within Matic. But I will admit that the thing that I've learned the most throughout this experience is prioritization, right? Like that is probably the number one skill when people ask me like hey what have you learned through this through this experience and starting your own company i would say like how to ruthlessly prioritize because your users and your customers and prospects are gonna want the world right and it's your job to be able to decipher what is valid and what is you know i get it but maybe that's just because that's the way you've always done it and that's just habit that's habitual but let's like, let's push back on that habit and that complacency and see if there's maybe a better way to be able to do this. That's what happens to a lot of, uh, that, well, what you just described, that's what happens to a lot of first time founders that are technical background is that the, you know, you kind of, you kind of cater towards the loudest voice Yep. and oftentimes the loudest voice wants you to make what they already have, <laughs> which is weird. Like it's a common thing. Many people ask you, they, they kind of like, Hey, I do, this is how I do things today. Can you match that? It's like, wait a second. I thought you were investing in innovation to do something differently, easier, something different, right? And they, they try to pull you into the back to like, well, this is what I know. And I think that's where the selling comes in, right? Like you have to be able to, you know, I, I look at ourselves like, yes, we're not necessarily creating a net new category, but I feel like we are creating a subcategory, right? And part of that becomes education. Like you're trying to educate your prospects and your customers on a new way of doing things, right? And you have to sell them on that vision. You have to sell them as like why this is better than their current status quo. And it, it is hard. Like you, in some cases, you have to say no. And you have to be ruthless in, in being able to say no because you, 
you have a small amount of resources and you got to take bets on what you think is going to be applicable to the masses instead of just like, oh, this one customer is paying me, you know, 50K a year. We got to do it. No, like you're going to have to push back sometimes, right? And I think that that prioritization is what I, I think has gotten us to where we're at today and hopefully we'll continue the success moving forward. Tell me how you go about prioritizing. I'd like to hear like some of your decision factors that, that you put in before you say like, what do you say yes to? What do you say this can wait to? You know, this is something that LinkedIn taught me really well. I always look at prioritization on the lens of two axes. One is like level of effort, right? And the other is the size of prize or the impact. Size of prize. I like that. Yeah. You want to like, you want to work on things that are low level of effort but are going to yield a high size of prize or high impact, right? And that's kind of that magic quadrant. And so, you know, when I get into the, into Monday mornings and I look at prioritization for the week, that's what I look at. I look at all the tasks and I say, okay, what are the things that are low effort, but are going to give a high size of prize? And there are going to be times where you do need to, you know, you're not, not all the tasks that you prioritize are going to be in that magic quadrant where they yield both of those. There are times where you're going to have to work on things that are a little bit more trivial, but they do go a long way, right? Especially when it comes to software. I always tell my dev team, like, you know, if the software is buggy or if there's a lot of workarounds, yeah, I get it. There is a workaround, but, you know, it's like death by a thousand cuts. You know, if, if, if there's too many workarounds, then it just becomes a bad experience for the end user and, and we want to limit those. Yeah. I mean, you kind of hit, hit it right there. And I'm going to ask you some more questions about that product decision-making that you make. Cause you said, you mentioned, you mentioned earlier that you have a, a product-based background. You know, how do you go about tackling product decisions? You mentioned before the user experience, because we know that when it comes to software today, because there's an abundance of choice, there's basically no tolerance for bad experience, right? Yeah. Because I can just go to something else that's probably comparable, or I can at least give it a shot. And if I'm giving it a shot, that means I'm considering somebody else. And if I'm considering someone else, it means I'm not considering you anymore, right? So how do you, how do you go about that? Because that's been a constant theme that we've understood throughout, throughout the course of the show is a lot of technical leads, you know, they might not be able to foresee the user experience and a lot of the, the user experience leads product leads are ha sometimes have challenges conveying like why this is important um so how do you go about measuring whether it's going to be a good experience or not when you have maybe someone on the technical side who might be in a disagreement or something where like well the feature works as is or whatever the common technical pushbacks are <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well lucky luckily like i would say my co-founder and i i mean my co-founder i was he's a unicorn um he's he's the the cto he's on the technical side he's been kind of building with our engine team but he also really understands the business problem and i always found that you know talk to the end users not just you but like bring some of your dev team to those user research sessions so that they hear firsthand what your customers are telling you, right? I think that is a, what PMs need to do more of is, is, you know, usually it's, they're the ones who use the research with product marketing and conveying it back to the, to the engineers. And the engineers are saying like, well, is that really the case? Should we be doing this? Blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, let, why don't you come with me and like, let, let me bring you on this journey. And like, you can hear firsthand what customers are telling me or prospects are telling me or our end users are telling me, right? So, and, and I found that's a very helpful way to get everybody on the same page so they can actually see the pain and it's not just coming from you, right? It's actually coming from the people that are using your products. So that's definitely one of the, the big ways that I think uh, help. And then the other is data, right? Like you got to look, Hey, look at how our, our data is trending, right? Like we launched this feature, people aren't using it, people are using it, right? Like at the end of the day, that's like black and white. And so you want to be able to share that data on a consistent basis with, with your entire organization to see like, hey, did we hit, you know, did we, did we hit a home run here or do we need to actually kind of go back and, and revisit what we, what we did originally? So talk to me about where you are today. You guys are currently, you know, we did a little homework. We saw that you raised a round, a seed round back in 2019. What is the business? Where is it trajecting? Where's its trajectory right now for you? Yeah. So we had, I mean, right now we are seven full time, just made an offer over the weekend that just got accepted. So it'll be eight. There you um, go. We're hiring for about five more, we have five open recs right now, uh, hiring across account management, engineering, marketing uh, as well. So we're probably going to be about 12. 12 to 13, hopefully uh, by June, July. That's also another one recruiting. Uh, you're not just doing sales. 
that's another thing that I've realized is being a first time founder is, is the recruiting aspect is super, super important and that you spend a lot of time trying to recruit top talent. So yeah, so we've had a great start to 2021. We've almost doubled ARR just in the first, in the first quarter than we did all of last year. So we're definitely seeing a lot of adoption within our customer base as well as within the market. And now I think it's just building, there you go. continuing to build on the product that we have. While at the same time, I think molding and building this team that I think will, you know, will continue to find success in the future. So how about for yourself, right? Because you started as a product guy, you know, you're working in product, you're developing products for at LinkedIn, you bring this product to life outside of LinkedIn at Asmatic, you're building, 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 but your hat starts to change. You're now selling, selling, selling. Now you're recruiting, recruiting, recruiting. So how much time are you now spending inside of product development, engineering versus let's say recruiting and sales? Because it sounds like you have a very robust pipeline. Uh, you already said you doubled sales. So I'm assuming that you are basically VP of sales right now. Yeah. Well, I just hired, I just hired a head of sales who I'm really, really, <laughs> who I'm really, really excited on. So I can kind of push some of this work off <laughs> after her. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it is hard. Like I, I try to stay pretty close to the product because that is a, is a passion of mine. And I enjoy, like I said, working with our inch team and kind of picking on that. But that's at the end of the day, you ask any, any founder, you know, this early on, it's just not a reality. You are going to have your hand in a lot of cookie jars, so to speak, right? You're going to be helping with marketing. You're going to be helping with onboarding. You're going to help with support. You're going to help with recruiting. I would say the number one priority right now is just like attracting top talent, right? So we feel like the product is in a good place. We've got some great, you know, customers, you know, pipeline is looking good. And now it's just, how do we build this team, uh, you know, and set it up for success? I think that's probably one of my number one priorities in the coming quarters. So how are you looking at recruiting today? Because one of the things that's, you know, we already know tech, the demand for tech talent is, it, it's, it's unending, right? Yeah. And we also know that, you're in startup mode, which means, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and guess that you can't pay what the big boys pay or the big, the big, the big co's pay big girls. You can call them whatever, right? Big companies have big wallets yeah. and talent. And now, you know, so someone told us before, it's like, well, the, the biggest challenge with remote work is like now the, the access to talent is, you know, they can hire anybody anywhere Yeah, and it's just a, it's a battlefield, right? So how are you, how are you going, what's your strategy for going about attracting talent, specifically tech talent, because that's, that seems to be one of the hardest things to get. Although as a CEO, you now know talent in any position is actually quite hard, like top marketing yeah. talent, top sales talent. They're not cheap either. <laughs> I, no, I agree. I mean, yeah, you are taking a risk running a startup, right? And a startup most likely is not going to be able to pay you what you're making at Salesforce, LinkedIn, any of the, the big tech companies. But I think what a startup can give you is autonomy and ownership, right? You aren't just a, you know, small cog in the, in the machine here. We're hiring you because we, ha we don't have the skill set that you have, right? Or we don't have the time. To, and so we want you to fully own this part of the, of the org. And I think a lot of people do look for that, especially if you have been at a company like Salesforce for a really long time. And you've just kind of, okay, you go through the OKRs, you go through things and it's like, great, I was able to contribute this, but like, what was your real impact? Whereas I think highlighting that impact at a startup is, is much, much easier. And I think it's way more quantifiable and you see it, you see it on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Yeah. Um, everything that you do has a material impact, not a trivial, a material impact on the business. And I think it's tough to explain to, to someone, right? Until you, unless you've actually done it, but the feeling that you get, is just, it's unbelievable. Um, you know, and I always kind of tell when I'm trying to recruit people, I always tell them like, Hey, you know, we are like family, you know, it's a cliche. Everyone says that, but I spend more time. I'm going to spend more time with you than I spend with, with my wife. Right. And so like at the end of the day, we want to build a team where, you know, we're learning from one another and, uh, you know, we're growing together, right. Not just, not just from a number standpoint from business, but you're growing and you're learning. And I can tell you from experience that you will learn way more at a small startup because you're going to wear multiple hats. You're going to test and it's okay to fail. Like, you know, I, I, I understand that you're, you're going to make some bets and you will fail and that's okay. Right. That's part of the journey, but you will learn more than just going through your, you know, working at a, at a bigger company or you're just focusing on one sliver of the, of the piece. And, you know, you don't have that ability to test as much because it has to, it has to work. Right. Yeah. The, uh, when I have one of my friends who went from a project management person at a startup to one of the big 
I don't know what they're called. They're like ERPs, but they're only for hospitals, like Epic Systems, Cerner. There's a couple. Of one- oh, yeah, yeah, like EHRs. Yeah, 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 I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. EHRs. Yeah, I'm not going to name the company that she went to, but she did make a comment. Like, <laughs> Her whole project will be, you know, her whole quarterly project will be what she would do like in a week at a startup. <laughs> and like, and it's like, it's not even clear. Like, does it matter? Like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, and. I mean, I'll look at like Blue Nose Analytics. I was there for, I was an early employee. I was up going the first five hires there, raised a lot. It wasn't a great success to be totally honest, but honestly, it was the best experience on my resume because I learned so much throughout the process. You know, I got, I, I was doing a little bit of product. I was doing a little bit of implementation. I was doing analytics. I was able to go to a lot of sales meetings. I was able to see like how the account executives interact with the customers, how the founders interact with the customers. And that, that experience was invaluable. And I would say it really helped me with Matic, right? Like LinkedIn taught me like what good looks like. Okay. Like once you get to scale, what does good look like? But, um, you know, working at Blue Notes, even though it wasn't a financial success, it was by far the best experience. And I learned the most during that. Now, how's it impacted you and your ability to evaluate talent? Because that's one of the things that a lot of times, you know, I think Jason Lemkin talks about it a lot because he's a big voice in SaaS, how he talks about how like when you're a startup and you hire a, uh, let's say big company person, a lot of times it doesn't fit. And then he, he names some reasons why culturally or, uh, skill wise, how does that impact it? Cause you've worked at now a big established tech firm and you've also worked at startups and now you are a startup CEO. What do you look for, I guess, in talent? Well, actually before that though, I think the reason why people coming from a bigger company to small company, doesn't usually work is because it, the, the people that were making the hiring decisions weren't transparent. And I see this all the time, Yeah, right? Like you're hiring a head, of, a head of marketing to come join your startup and you don't set the expectations. Like you're a team of one right now. Yeah. What's my agency budget? You don't have one. <laughs> so you got to get your hands. What happens? Like, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Or like, Hey, you're going to, you're going to manage five people. No. Like you got to set the expectation from the get go that this is different. You're not going to have the budget. You're not going to have, you're not going to be managing a team right away. Yeah. And I think that is the biggest mistake that founders make. Where's my video guy? We don't have a video guy. <laughs> like, oh, you can't do video. I thought you could do video. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think that's the biggest mistake that founders make when they're recruiting is they're just not transparent and honest as to like what the role really entails. Right. And if you think about it, it's, it's you spend all this time recruiting this individual and you don't want them to leave after six months, right? Because then you, you not only spent the time, now you got to go back into the market to try to replace them and you got to retrain somebody net new. So just be upfront with them and say, Hey, this is the expectation. These are your roles and responsibilities. And it will be ambiguous. I don't know 12 months from now, I think this is what's going to happen, but that's part of the job, right? Like we're going to kind of figure this out together. Yeah. And so I always look, I always let people know that there's ambiguity with joining a startup and you need to be comfortable with it. It's okay if there is a little bit of tension and, and it makes you, dis- you have some discomfort, but um, you know, that's just the way startups work. There's going to be ambiguity. So I always try to lead with transparency and letting them know exactly what they're getting themselves into. And then, you know, letting them make the decision. Like I want you to ultimately join because you feel like this is the best decision for you to make. Right. I don't want to force you or persuade you to make a decision. And then six months from now, you realize that this wasn't a good fit, right? From the onset. So I think you do have to be honest and you got to let them make the decision, not you make the decision for them. No, that's awesome stuff. Well, Nick, it is now time for the lightning round. The lightning round is brought to you by the Salesforce platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of their experience. Nick, this is where we ask you questions outside of work so that our audience can get to know you a little bit better. Oh, okay, okay. So you've shared a lot about Matic, you've shared a lot about recruiting, hiring, getting talent. Now we gotta know a little bit about you outside of the work. You ready? Okay, sounds good, let's do it. Like I said, it's not gonna be too weird. You're gonna be fine. All right, what, <laughs> what is one piece of technology that wows you? One piece of technology that wows me. I think Spotify, I just, I, I use it every single day. It's like literally, uh, yeah, it just always blows me away at, at how the configurability and the ease of use. I just love the experience. When you listen to Spotify, would you say your music tastes are diverse or do you kind of stay in one genre of music? 
uh it's gotten a lot more diverse i would say i love <laughs> i'm a big r&b guy i love a little bit of hip-hop i'm starting to get into e- a little bit of edm my co-founder really <laughs> likes it so I- i'm getting into it but yeah it's, it's starting to get more diverse do you use the spotify radio product uh i do not i have my playlist so i i kind of i definitely have my playlist well i I used to be the same way. I was like, I'm going to be playlist only until I tried radio. And I was like, huh, it's actually pretty cool. It, okay. finds, it finds me a lot of new stuff that I otherwise would not have listened to. So, I mean, give it a try. One one thing I will give, I'll give a shout out. I love the new music Friday. That's like one of the things I look forward to is when they come up with like, hey, here's all the new releases that come that have come out on Friday. It's just like, I don't know. It's like something that I always look forward to. And I, I love listening to that playlist. Awesome. So you, we know that you're a music fan now. What other, what else are you a fan of? How would you describe yourself? You like music, but don't talk to, don't talk about products. You like music and you like to. Oh man, I'm a big soccer fan. Yeah? So I, I'm originally from, from Bosnia, from Europe. So I immigrated to the States back in, in 90, 97. And I've just loved, I, I had a stint in Germany and my love for soccer is just like, I, I, I'm the person that wakes up you know, at four in the morning on Saturday and Sunday to watch the English Premier League because that's the time it's on. So big soccer fan. All right. What is, what's your favorite squad? Which, which squad do you follow? Oh, man. Arsenal and the EPL. All right, we're not doing so hot right now. So but <laughs> you know, I got to stick with my team. The Gunners all the way. Listen, as someone who knows, I, I co-work with someone who was from Le- Leicester City. Okay. The year that they, wo- they oh. won the championship after being like 10,000 to one dogs. Magical. Magical. Yeah. Anything's possible. I, <laughs> that was a great, that was, I, I hope that they make some movies out of that. Cause that was just, that was spectacular. That, that was one heck of a season. Yeah. It got to the point where William Hill Sportsbook will no longer take bets at that scale. Really? It was 10,000 to one people. Cause like hometown people were putting a hundred bucks on it. Yep. <laughs> you know, putting a thousand bucks on it, like at the beginning of the season and they won. So. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's awesome. So, have you ever been to a professional game? I have. Uh, I've been to been to a few. What was that experience like? Uh, so, what was it? Probably like five, six years ago. My twin brother and two of my best friends. We did a trip, um, last minute trip in April to to Europe, and we just saw like all for some reason in that ten ten day window, all the big games were happening. So we went to holland uh the netherlands and we saw like a rivalry game there we went to italy and saw like two big games there and then we went to germany and this was probably my favorite my brother and i when we you know when we were in germany i was a borussia dortmund fan for for those of you know and then my brother was a bayern munich fan and those two back in the day were always like one and two and even now today they're back one and two and so there was a picture of my brother and i when we were little kids in our you know respective dirt jerseys and then we were able to kind of go watch the Derby, watch the game in, in Munich. And I had my Borussia Dortmund jersey on. He had his Bayern Munich. So what, you know, 20 years later, it was just like a fun experience. So that's probably the best game that I've been to. The atmosphere was unbelievable. I mean, to this day, just gives me goosebumps every single time I think about it. All right. Dude, that is pretty cool recreating that, like, a little childhood to, to yeah. turn into a magical, like, adult moment. Exactly. Last question for us. You just kind of alluded to it. You are a twin do you and your twin brother have weird like connection where he gets hurt then you get hurt same place (laughs) (laughs) um no nothing like that's ever happened there are times where like you know we'll be in the car and be dead silent and all of a sudden we're like we like we'll start humming to a song or start thinking of the exact same song that came out of the it's not on the radio or anything like that so (laughs) definitely things like that but nothing nothing too crazy Mission's co-founder is a twin. Okay. And uh, so we always ask twin questions if we get the opportunity to. Awesome. <laughs> well, Nick, we appreciate you joining us today on IT Visionaries. Thanks for sharing your story about, you know, your career and starting Matic. And of course, we wish you all the best of luck. Awesome, Albert. Thanks for having me. Really had a good time. IT Visionaries is created by the team at mission.org and brought to you by the Salesforce Customer 360 platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Build connected experience, empower every employee, and deliver continuous innovation with the customer at the center of everything you do. Learn more at salesforce.com platform. <laughs>